Comprising more than 1,000 years, the Copper Age, also known as the Chalcolithic period, was symbol. Written symbols started to evolve into writing, and prehistory gently changed into ancient history in this age of human existence. The Copper Age is between the Stone and the Bronze Ages. Though they happened at different times and in different locations, essentially these ages followed this sequence of development, from stone to copper, then bronze, then onto iron. Derived from Greek terms for copper and stone, the Copper Age is sometimes known as Chalcolithic. This underlines how often stone tools were still used in conjunction with copper ones over the time. Since copper and bronze were both widely used alongside one another and the adoption of bronze happened at different times and in different places, the line separating the copper from the bronze era is likewise very hazy. Bronze saw the birth of humanity's first major empires, those of Sumer, Akkad, Egypt, and Babylon. Important innovations like the domestication of crops and farm animals as well as technologies like the bow and arrow and pottery happened in the older Stone Ages. The building blocks for these civilizations were gathered in the Copper Age and the Stone Age. These developments along the technological tree made it possible for increasingly bigger communities to flourish. Hamlets grew into villages which expanded into towns the greatest communities of the Neolithic period such cattle, Hayuk and Jericho, had populations of a few 1,000 people. In contrast to these enormous settlements, which had their time of growth and subsequently fall, most of the other larger settlements that had been uncovered from this period seem to have only numbered a few 100 people. On the high end, these tiny settlements were significantly more usual and abundant throughout the Fertile Crescent, especially in northern Mesopotamia. The early farming societies of the region, including the ubiquitous Halaf culture, employed a primitive kind of farming called dry farming that relied on rainwater and favorable weather. It is possible the Halaf, or the neighboring Husana culture, that was the first to smelt metal as a few copper and lead objects have been recovered at their sites. There is also, about the same period, evidence of copper mining on what is now Israel and in far-flung Serbia. There are a few copper objects that have also been unearthed that may be the oldest yet found. There are also very old copper artifacts found from the pre-Harappan Indus Valley, which may indicate multiple places around the world, discovered copper smelting independently, just as it appears to have independently developed in East Asia, West Africa, and the Americas a little later. It is important to note that precisely dating any artifacts from this far back in our distant past is extremely difficult, and often the subject of debate, whatever the case may be, over the course of many centuries. Copper smelting technology slowly improved and spread throughout the greater Near East. So why is copper the first metal age practically everywhere? One reason copper, along with lead and gold, are generally the first metal for mankind to melt is because they are all quite gorgeous copper, or oxidizes and turns various attractive shades of green, which helps it stand out from many less useful rocks. Another reason is its relatively low melting point compared to iron. And a third reason is copper is one of the most prevalent metals found on Earth. It's not found everywhere, although it is found in many places. So, why was copper a better material than stone? For many tools, one of copper's primary strengths over stone tools has made it difficult to establish exactly when the copper H originated and when and where did copper tools first become ubiquitous. Reason number one, you can recycle it. Copper jewelry could be melted down and remade into weapons of war, and in times of peace, these may be reworked into farming, construction, or mining implements. In these early days of metallurgy, copper items were uncommon and precious. Copper would have been passed down from father to son as an inheritance and taken away as spoils of war. As copper smelting skills advanced and the population of the Near East rose, many of the early copper objects were certainly recycled several times throughout the generations. Which contributes to the restricted number of Copper Age finds, also the geopolitical situation in that area of the world. Over the last couple of decades has made archaeological investigation there extremely challenging. Another one of copper's advantages over the vast array of previously popular decorative rocks that were utilized is that it was well balanced between its hardness and ability to keep an edge. Stones like obsidian and flint which were used, used for arrowheads and small blades were exceedingly sharp, sharper than copper, but they were also quite brittle which made them prone to fracture. Many of the stones used for axes were harder but couldn't keep an edge as well as copper and were still fragile when compared to copper. Producing a stone blade or a polished AX was a very labor-intensive, time-consuming process, which required a great deal of patience and skill and many hours of chipping or grinding, which could potentially end in disaster during manufacture or use, 
a shattered stone would have erased many hours of work. In contrast, copper, which is more malik, is significantly more likely to bend than to break with a little bit of hammering. A bent copper tool could be rapidly fixed, or a severely broken copper tool might be melted down and recast into something new, or the same thing, and no material would be lost. As copper tools rose in popularity throughout the Near East, less people were specializing in the manufacture and trade of stone tools. Consequently, the quantity and quality of stone tools at Copper H sites declined because copper tools were more efficient. It freed up more of the populace to specialize in other occupations. At the same time as when copper was first becoming more commonly used, two additional major innovations were introduced. The potter's wheel, which made the creation of pottery less time demanding, and irrigation. Before irrigation, southern Mesopotamia had been sparsely inhabited. The region received relatively little rainfall. Additionally, the swampy marshlands around the lower Tigris and Euphrates rivers were not ideal for farming, and a few spots which were excellent for farming were prone to repeated flooding after irrigation. It became the most densely populated area on Earth. The Samara culture to the south of the Halaf shows earliest evidence of irrigation. The technology spread south to the Ubaid culture, which mastered the ability to control the river and cultivate previously unusable land. The Ubaid population grew rapidly, and either through migration, war, or peaceful cultural influence. Their material culture supplanted older civilizations of northern Mesopotamia during the Ube period. Traces of a governing class seemed to develop around the temple administrative centers there. The management of a growing population, food stockpiles, manufactured commodities, and cattle were administered. The numbers of these were high enough where a good memory was not enough to keep track of it all throughout the Copper Age in Mesopotamia. Increasingly complicated clay accounting tokens were utilized. Early tokens came in a range of shapes and sizes with important marks on them. Later, tokens featured pictographic characters. These were used to symbolize ownership of a resource, like this token, which is believed to represent 10 goats or sheep. Some were also used to label the contents of a container to identify what was within. Later, other symbols were introduced to indicate personal names and professions. Writing continued to flourish throughout the next Uruk period. Transactions, contracts, and other sorts of records began to be preserved on tablets. Uruk, the city for which the period is called, had an astonishing population for the time, estimated to have been as high as 80,000 people. Eridu was another prominent city of the era. It expanded from a modest Ubaid town into a big city. The later Sumerians believed that Eridu was the first city in the world, and it was the first city to have a ruler for more than 2,000 years. Eridu would be an important religious hub where Mesopotamian monarchs paid tribute to the city's patron, god Enki, through trade and possibly battle. Erks. Influence spread throughout Mesopotamia and beyond Mesopotamia's. Ravenous demand for more copper incentivized longer distance trade routes than ever before. Even in far off Egypt in the age before the pharaohs, Mesopotamia produced or influenced pottery and artifacts found there during the Copper Age. The kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt fought against each other in many forgotten wars, but the legacy of these two warring states lived on for thousands of years in the ancient Egyptian pharaoh's crown, which was a combination of the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt. Even though the pre-dynastic Egyptians knew how to smelt copper by the mid-4th millennium BC, they had no domestic sources of copper, and the nearest source were the mines in the Sinai Desert. Controlling these mines was always a high priority once ancient Egypt's two kingdoms combined. Much of the copper ore from the Sinai had trace quantities of arsenic in it, which made it tougher. Copper, which contains more than 1% of arsenic, is called arsenical bronze. The inclusion of arsenic makes copper much harder and stronger. Undoubtedly, the first arsenical bronze was manufactured by mistake because the arsenic naturally occurs in some copper ore. But this mishap did not go in. Notice by the end of the copper H, arsenical bronze had become standard as people figured out that adding arsenic made the copper stronger. This superior metal had the poor side effect of being exceedingly poisonous. This must have motivated many early blacksmiths to look for a substitute that wasn't so toxic and also made copper stronger after generations of experimenting. It was discovered that tin, a much more rare metal, made bronze, which was stronger, harder, and could hold an edge better than any metal that had come before. It, as copper had done before, bronze dramatically increased humans production in Mesopotamia the Uruk era steadily evolved into the early Sumerian dynastic era. It is important to note that the delineation of time between Ubaid, Uruk, and Sumerian often overlap, as they are modern scholarly constructs, and it is unclear and people use different definitions of when time periods begin and end. 
and their utility comes from their ability to compartmentalize and make sense of this very complicated time. The Sumerian period saw larger cities, more powerful kings, and a more developed writing system, where a chronological timeline of historical events can more easily be assembled to the Sumerians, the Copper Age became a time of myth and legend, where kings walked with gods and epic events brought about civilization as bronze technology spread throughout Eurasia. Ancient Egypt lingered behind in the Copper Age for a few more centuries. This film has been sponsored by Copper. If you buy some, you can break a zinc scent with it. And I would want to thank my great patrons over on Patreon. Be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and all that other wonderful stuff. Thank you very much for viewing this. Benepimetheus.